also very handy tissue autophagy. So what happens is the animal starts to break down surplus tissue in its organs, stuff it into its mitochondria to make energy, and starts to feed that energy to the brain. Okay? And if you're disassembling whole blocks of tissue, you're probably also disassembling precancerous lesions as well, which is where the protective effect comes from. The protective effect, I stress, appears to only occur in protective environments. This is new data. It isn't well known, but it should be. It's work from a lady called Elizabeth Gardner. If you monitor, the, um, for example, the immune function of calorie-restricted animals, it looks like it's all right. So these animals appear to have reasonably okay immune function compared to old animals. However, if they are actually given an infective, ch infective challenge, they die. And they die at higher rates than fully fed old animals. And this appears to, at least in part, be due to a deficit in natural killer cell activity. The short answer is, you know, why do they do this? Well, the simple answer is, if you think about having an infection, you need extra resources to fight it off. And so, if in fact you don't have them, your infective response is going to be compromised. But it does at least point some ways to which we might be able to get extended health spans. So, there we go. The other thing to look at, I'm really keen on this area, but very, very little has been done, is to look at long-lived animals. Now, there's a bit of a twist here, because the animal has to be long-lived, but not immortal. And establishing that it is long-lived and not immortal, when it lives four times longer than you, can be a real bummer. Okay, put bluntly. So the best objective is this one, or the best one apparently is this one, Arctic or Icelandic. Commercially fish species, about 100,000 tonnes of Arctica, caught every year and end up in chowder. There was a minor sort of ruption in the press when one of these organisms was fished out, it was 400 years old, and was sectioned as part of a climate change survey. So the people responsible were described as the scientists who found the oldest living thing in the world and then killed it, which didn't actually endear the media to them in any particular way. Okay? These guys would be a good price. They have muscles, a gut, a nervous system, and they have to keep this working for centuries. And they're also pretty tractable. They have minimal requirements, you know, some algae, a cold room, they die if the temperature gets much above 15 degrees because they're a deep water species, and that's about it. However, are they simply too alien to tell us anything at all about us? And Although work on Arctica is just beginning, I would argue that they are not too alien. And I argue this on the basis of some work that's done down in Brighton with another mollusk. It's quite a long way away. This is Limnaeus stagnalis. This is the pond snail. It's a short-lived animal. It lives for about two years. Okay? It's widely studied as a model <coughs> of learning and memory. Some people who work on Limnaeus say that Limnaeus can be taught anything you can teach a rat or mouse. I just sort of do it more slowly. Okay. And as a result of this, we have a partial map of their brains. They're very simple nervous system, about 20,000 neurons, so, and you can swap neurons around between organisms. Okay. And this is a perfect little model to study neuronal aging, which is what I'm going to talk about. If you look at the loop, the three neuron loop that regulates feeding, this is the cerebral giant cells in the animal. Okay, you don't need to be terribly familiar with patch clamp monitoring of neurons to see a very, very clear difference. Very good spiking in the young animals, in the middle-aged and old animals, you see much reduced spiking. And this correlates, this firing rate also correlates with deficits in feeding in the animals. So what we have here is a very, we have the ZX80 of brains, basically. Better word. An awful lot easier to take to pieces than a crow. Okay. Okay. Which brings us to the thing I'm going to talk about next. Something called cellular senescence. Cellular senescence is the stay is a stable, irreversible growth arrest. It's distinct from cell death and it's associated with big changes in phenotype. Okay? And it's premature senescence that is responsible for the very poor growth we think 
of cells from Berners syndrome patients. The molecular pathways associated with the control of senescence are quite well worked out now. Suffice it to say they are tissue specific and species specific, which leads to diagrams like that. Okay. That should give everybody enough time to commit that to memory. So, as a result of the operation of that pathway, if you grow cells in culture, you see this, they grow, they stop. If you look at the cells that can never go again, that grows up smoothly in number. And if you monitor the number of cells that are capable of division, you see it falls away quite smoothly. All right? So basically, anything that drives cell turnover, ordinary cell replacement, drives this process. This wouldn't be such bad news, except senescent cells have really very different patterns of gene expression compared to their growing counterparts. And the gene expression changes that you see are pretty bad, pretty much, most of the time. This is a microarray output, for those who aren't familiar with it. Each one of these little blobs <coughs> is basically the expression level of a gene. And the reason you see blocks of color, we call this a heat map, is because the software that records this clusters the genes together in blocks with no other assumptions than are their genes doing approximately the same thing. What you can see, red is up, green is down. What you can see is a huge block of genes are upregulated when cells are dividing, but not when they're asleep. A block of genes are upregulated when genes are asleep, but not when they're senescent. And a block of genes are upregulated when they're senescent, but not asleep. And the genes upregulated in senescence include a whole load of pro-inflammatory molecules. These are very, very inflammatory cells. Okay, and we think that this is driving the pathology of Werner's syndrome. So, this would be you. The normal course of your life, you lose cells. That loss is balanced by cell division in mitotic tissue compartments. S cell division is monitored as an active anti-cancer mechanism. And this leads to the production of senescent cells. These guys build up in tissue as you get older. And what we see as aging, or one component of it, is probably the accumulation of senescent cells in the, in the tissue. In Werner's syndrome, this is probably what's going on. You're probably losing cells at the same rate. That loss is balanced by cell division. S cell division is three to five times more likely to make senescent cells, <coughs> and so these probably build up three to five times more frequently. And there is another disease that's also quite famous known as hutchinson guilford progeria. That's a slight tweak on this idea. It looks as if you probably can't maintain the cells that you do make. I'm happy to talk about that a bit later. Now, we can stop Premature senescence happening in Werner's syndrome fibroblast in culture. This is a molecule called SB20358 because 4,5-fluorophenol, 2,4-methylsulfolphenol, 1-H-imidazole, 4 gamma pyridine is probably a bit of a mouthful, so I'll just call it SB. SB inhibits P38 map kinases within cells, a specific class of signaling enzymes. It is not very precise. It inhibits P38, but some other molecules as well. And unpicking exactly what signal it's jamming is proving more difficult than we might have first have thought. However, the results, as they say, speak for themselves. If you take <coughs> SB and add it to normal cells growing in culture, you see a little extension of lifespan, but not very much. However, if you add it to Werner's syndrome cells, you see down near complete rescue of the growth phenotype, back to normal levels. I'll explain why if you're interested. But what this strongly suggests is that this represents a therapeutic route potentially in this disease. Because molecules like that are in phase two clinical trials now. P38 MAC kinases are some of the most heavily drugged targets in the human chimera. So we are still